Hi, and welcome back to Galactic Storyteller. I am wanting to take a moment to thank you guys. The last video that I put out regarding the suicide of my son, as you can see, was not the easiest thing to record. And I want to thank you for your kind words, your compassion, and your support. Um, I am very excited to have Asia Rain back with us today. We're just going to jump right in because we've got some great information. The last two uh, interviews that I've done with Asia have been pretty heavy. We are going to be going into some very interesting information. We're going to do some cooperation with um, a source that contacted me regarding the underground tunnels, uh, which he was able to cooperate uh, Asia's testimony. So that's very exciting. And we're also going to be talking about the importance of developing discernment. So with that being said, let's check in with you, Asia. How have you been? I've been great. I've been busy. I've been moving some things, moving my, myself around in different areas, my studio. I've got new location and I have been kind of really involved in that aspect of my life. But still learning even more stuff on uh, the spiritual development and even empowerment side of my life and reading over um, some of my uh, my memories, uh, just going back over the years of memory recovery that I've been doing. And so there's been some really great things that I've been able to go back and read. And you and I have had these great conversations about, you know, where do we want to take this? How do we want this to um, actually be presented? And what feels what feels guided and what feels right, you know, to come up next. And so I've been doing really well and I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. Excellent. So uh, like I alluded to just a moment ago, we had um, an ex-church employee contact me a few weeks ago. I have had a ton of information sent to me, including pictures of an underground tunnel, the tunnel system that you talked about, um, not that you need cooperation for what you already know, but how does that make you feel knowing that there's photographic evidence, which we're going to show the audience in just a minute. How does that make you feel knowing that this wasn't to my imagination, this is actually real and here's evidence of it. I, it's really gratifying in a way. Um, I'm at a point where I don't need to have you know, somebody come in and validate, but it takes a long time to get to this point. It did for me. Like when you first start in your journey, and I'm just brought, bringing this out for anybody that is at the beginning of um, a journey of their own recall and trying to put puzzle pieces together, really having that outside validation and the validation from others that have similar stories where you can actually have aha moments or um, dots that connect mm -hmm. it, it's almost like what happens is is your system just kind of relaxes where you're just like you're not carrying the burden um, on your own anymore like just even in your own vacillating and I'll, I'll tell you when you're first in this and it, and it when I say first in this I'm talking for me it was years into uh, recovering my memories that I would, I would have um, a session and my body was having body memories. My emotions were validating like the entire thing. I was re-experiencing stuff that there's no way I could have made up. And I finished the session and I'm walking out to the car going, I, I had to have made all this up. Like, I can't, I can't, I've got no place for this. I don't even know how to put this anywhere. This is crazy. Who does this? Right. So to know that the few times and you know that even my therapist would validate me and say there have been others that have remembered the same thing it was just like oh thank goodness like I I'm so grateful to hear that right and so to even have somebody reach out to you um unprovoked really mm -hmm. this person felt whatever they were feeling motivated to reach out and say I can, I can actually validate this. I can collaborate with what I heard Asia say, and I have some information I want to offer you is really, really powerful. And so as we go into these, into the pictures, um, I clearly from the ones that, you know, the one you showed me, like that system has been 
really updated. Mm -hmm. And I would also, um, I want to say volunteer, but I am going to also put on the table here that because there are so many levels below ground in this particular um, area of Salt Lake City, that the tunnels, a number of the tunnels that I was taken through would look different than even the ones the employees were allowed to be in because they weren't allowed to be in the ones that they have been used for ceremonies and trafficking and um, higher level dignitaries coming in and having secret meetings, one of which I've witnessed, well, I've witnessed a few secret meetings that you're not going to know about. They're not going to advertise. You're not even going to have a an airport manifest um, validate that those individuals were even in the area or that they had even flown in because, you know, they're going to come in on a private jet and people are involved over at the airport, you know, like all of these things, they're all, all organized when it comes to security. So this is a long way to answer that question, but I am saying it's really validating. I, I really appreciate that. And I also know that there's more in addition to that. Yeah, and I think it's really important that we remind the audience that when you are first going through therapy and you're trying to um, organize or first of all, have recall, memory recall, but then organize these things, you are working from a fractured mind state. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking maybe I am crazy or maybe I'm not recalling this correctly because of the fragmentation process that happens when um, they are disassociating your mind through trauma. Absolutely. So it's, it's very easy to fall into the whole, am I crazy type of a bit. And so, yes, you do have to be further down the road in your healing process in order not to need that validation. But for many out there who mm -hmm. are either beginning this process or in there in the middle of the healing process, they're still walking that line of, is this something that I'm recalling that's valid or am I, am I bonkers? You know what right, I mean? Right. So. The thing that I do want to say for when you are in that, in, in that phase or when you are really wading through all of the emotions and information and the things like, and it, it does feel like you're wading through a swamp. Like it's just, it just doesn't feel like it's solid ground or anything like that. The one thing that I would like to come, you know, like really offer as um, kind of encouragement is you need to believe yourself. So believe what you're, believe what's happening, believe what you're remembering, believe yourself, because as you're believing that you need to look at it like they are breadcrumbs that are going to lead you into what you're, what it, what you're really trying to show yourself the truth is. So you, you need to have that in sections. And so if you keep pushing it aside, you've got nothing to build on. So what you're going to do is you're going to believe yourself until you actually realize it's like, Oh, 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 I misunderstood that this information just developed what I thought was back here a little more. And now I have even more information. So I'm going to keep going with this information. And then if you ever get to a place where you realize that this was incorrect, you've been able to like, at least believing in this gets you to the point where you see, oh, that was incorrect. This was incorrect. I made that assumption because somebody else while I was in this drug state or while I was traumatized told me that this is where I was, you know? So a lot of times they'll do that. Like they'll, you will have, um, you'll be told that you're, I don't know, like in Egypt or something. And maybe you are, maybe you're not. All you can do is go with that information and say, I think I'm in Egypt. I'm going to keep going until for me, like I have a similar situation where, I was actually in a, in an entire, um, set, um, you know, a room that was created. It was an Egypt room that was used specific for ceremony. And I was told I was in Egypt. And then once I got more of the, uh, ceremony and the, and the lay of the land, I realized I may have been told that back here, but now I'm seeing all the details and kind of the the set, the things that weren't right and somebody that might not be in costume. Like I, I start pulling in all of the details, but I had to believe that in order for me to build forward. So that's what I'm trying to say is like, 
you really need to trust yourself. This is also a very, very powerful practice in self-trust, which is going to go into discernment as we're going to talk about later. You need to trust yourself enough that you can keep going with it and not anchor into, in this case, you know, like that example, I was in Egypt. I, that's all I know. You know, it's like, keep going, keep going, get the details, get the details. And then you're like, Oh, actually, this was a set in Provo, you know, in this building, in this warehouse. You know, I think most people struggle with learning how to trust themselves. And we are going to be talking about discernment uh, later on in the show. But to that point, it is a stepping stone towards the truth. Like I always told my kids when they were younger, I'm going to give you age appropriate truth. But as you get older and you mature, we're going to expound upon that truth and you're going to get a wider picture of what that truth entails. That doesn't mean the first portion was a lie or it was misrepresented. Just like when you're a small child and you know that mom has a baby in her tummy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not really in your stomach. It's in, it's in your uterus, but you don't know that until you get older when the child is developing and then they can start to understand a little more about what that actually means and the details of it. So this is just when you're learning to trust yourself when these memories are coming forward, that's just part of the process. That's what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. So gotcha. when you trust yourself, it's doing two things. It is actually practicing and reinforcing self-trust and giving you the authority that you never had, especially in these situations, you the, to have um, the programming of, of authority always being outside of you is reinforced over and over. So giving yourself the, the permission, the privilege and the um, ability to trust yourself is going to have a number of purposes. And that's a very powerful one. And it also, like I was saying, it is going to lead you to the bigger picture. So then you can really get more of what what it was that you're trying to show yourself and you do have to go in these increments like you don't step into this process you know an expert this we're not experts on ourselves you know we're in continual learning processes and it is it it's it's a it's a very powerful thing to continually learn about yourself part of that is trusting yourself and then being very compassionate when you look back and you realize oh i was just actually in a mentality of, you know, like of a child and, you know, I thought mama had a baby in her tummy kind of idea, you know, like you can yeah. see what you were able to really um, internalize and process and kind of work with. And along all of this too, there is that cognitive dissonance that you as a good human could not fathom doing any of this stuff. Like you just, it just isn't in you as a good human to do some of these things. And so when you're finding yourself witnessing um atrocities like this it that's so that it's it's so disorienting and dissociative plus if you you know like in my case as a victim in a in a situation like this you i've been drugged you know so now i'm under the influence of a substance and i'm being told things and you know like the orientation is very like you said fractured and pulling that together gives you a fuller picture. So trusting yourself is a big part of that. You know, we talk about some very, very heavy things on this channel. Um, and I try to bring light and humor into it just because I know that these are, these are huge topics to tackle. And partly because um, it's not something that the normal person would think to do. It's not part of their life. And so they're like, this is it's mind blowing. My husband has a hard time listening to a lot of the details just because it's like, who does this? But this is your life experience. And this is what is this, uh, and as far as the church is concerned, this is the church that's in charge of now 16 million people's salvation. But yeah. these are the activities that mm -hmm. they are um, running. And they're participating in and they're orchestrating. And we have to understand that it's not just about false doctrine anymore. No. These are the principles, the Luciferian principles that are in charge of the entire organization. And you cannot call yourself a truth seeker or somebody who feels truth is important unless you're willing to go to the bottom of the barrel and uncover the darkness that's down there. And the only way you can do that is through the light. 
That's the only way that that can happen. So you have to be really solid in who you are and understand that although this may not be the way you live your life and this may not be how you think, but it is important to understand that that's who's running this organization. And that's why it's so appalling to us. Yeah, absolutely. And with, with that as well, the more the more of that information can be presented in front of you and you can actually look at it and in your best effort to be objective about it, then you suddenly are able to start making choices about that. Do I want to be associated with a with an organization where at its core, this is what it's based on. This is what they're doing. This is how the the spirit, the rules, the regulations, the the decisions that are made, even the curriculum that is actually printed and put out, it's designed to reinforce and to support what's at the core, not the people's mentality or their salvation or their spirituality at all. It's it's really meant to cap that and to keep them yeah. captive. Yeah. Do you want to show the picture of the tunnel? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do that. Okay, so while you're while you're getting that, um, let me just lay a little foundational groundwork for this. I had an ex church employee contact me a few weeks ago. Uh, he has sent me a number of pictures uh, of all kinds of information, and so this is where the picture comes from. This person wants to remain anonymous for now, um, which is great. I am very grateful that um, he, she sent this, this picture. It's very interesting. Don't you think? Yeah. 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 And so do you have, do you want me to do a screen share? I need to yeah, go it. ahead and put it up. Do you have, um, do you have that? Hold on a second. All right. So you're the one that can actually do the, the screen sharing. Do you have that on your computer? Oh, I do, but I'm not. I don't have it pulled up and ready right now. What I can do is this. I've got it on my phone. Yeah, yeah, do it. Okay. Show it. And I, I took off. <laughs> I, want this. I should be using my computer right now, but I just happen to have it sitting right here. So this is, I had to take off uh, identifying information, but this is one of the pictures of the underground tunnel system that goes from, uh, the, I think it's the temple or maybe it's the Joseph Smith building to the temple, something mm -hmm. like that. But there's a whole networking system of this. Yes. Yes. And this looks familiar to you. They're going to be in layers too. So that there's a, a number of, um, there's underground tunnels that are used just as um, traffic ways for employees and um other other uh, dignitaries, whatever, so they don't have to walk the surface streets. Okay. So there's going to be a number of um, employees that could corroborate that and say, yeah, like that's that's there. We don't we didn't want to walk outside the Joseph Smith Memorial Building to go here to go there to you know show our recommend. You know they just they're just using these tunnel ways to get back and forth between all of those buildings. The um, the tunnel system that I'm most familiar with that I was in the, in more often would have been a tunnel system that was accessed mainly for um, accessing ceremonial rooms and um, what you would call, you know, trafficking victims, children, people, that kind of thing. Dignitaries that are there to be secret can be on the, on the different levels. The, the tunnels that um, back when I was being taken through those tunnels would have been in the 70s and maybe early 80s. And the lighting that you had in that picture was not the lighting they had back then. Back then it was kind of like, you know, a light here and then go down a little farther and a light here. Kind of, you know, like that would Dungeness. be- Dungeness? Did you say vintage? No, Dungeness. <laughs> Dungeness. Yeah, yeah, it would have been, but it would have been more dungeonous because they didn't have the continuous lighting in the in the um, tunnels that I was in. However, the the cement floor they did have a cement floor. Um, they can they could drive uh, vehicles in it, trucks, golf carts, that kind of thing could be driven in in these tunnels. And the the one that I'm going to show you a picture of 
I drew a map of these would be more walking tunnels. These aren't going to, you could put like, you could drive like maybe a golf cart in it, but um, these tunnels were not vehicle tunnels. Um, so just knowing that there is a tunnel system is also really important to know. It's not just the tunnel or the tunnel with its branches. There's layers, like there's different okay. levels of tunneling. So um, before I get to the map, I wanted to read um, from one of the um, <clears throat> one of the sessions that I had about what was going on. So this is me speaking, like I'm I'm actually speaking to my therapist, and I said I'm supposed to learn more about this tunnel. Um, I'm supposed to remember the details. I'm seeing wide stairs, and it's um, kind of sketchy to me, so I'm just going to keep going along with this. Um, the tunnel doesn't seem to have any abrupt turns in it. It seems fairly straight, maybe has a slight curve. I feel like we end up under Temple Square. I keep hearing you um, under Hotel Utah. And then I get a little bit stuck in it because trying again, like we were talking, trying to get this information is not exactly like, oh, here it is. Um, when I come through forward even more than I'm pacing myself, there's more doors at the end of the tunnel. Um, there's actually more doors than just um, gen along this tunnel than just the one. There's the wide stairs and um, behind the stairs, there's a door on each side. And for some reason, I keep focusing on the door that's on the left. He pulls, and this would be, let's see, I think who am I with? I'm with um, Tom Monson, and we meet up with Boyd K. Packer. Um, he pulls a key out. Let's see. The door on the left is actually on the north. I keep focusing on the door that's on the left. Um, he pulls a key for, and it's on the, it's the north tunnel. Um, it's the door on the left by the stairs, and it's um, a ceremony room. And then I said, um, let's see. These stairs lead up and they break off at one point. One set goes into the temple itself, and then the other one goes out to the outside building. It's like a little guard shack, it's smaller. Um, it really seems like an office with a chair. I know this building, uh, and I it looks like a bus stop. So this is that guard shack that I was, I've seen it there and it was just, um, it was where we start, like we were, where we went up into that. And then from there, we're outside the temple grounds. And uh, let's see. The purpose of this little place is so you can access the temple and end up on the temple grounds without being detected. So if you don't want to go into the temple itself, you can actually go into this guard shack and you can go down the stairs and go right into the temple. And somehow it leads to the tabernacle as well. Um, we go into a, the room. So I was telling about the guard shack, but now we're going into the ceremony room at the bottom of the steps. And I said, I've been in this room before. There's a lot of um, ceremonies that happen here. It's got a stone floor. Um, the robes are kept in a, in a closet. So people have, there's robes in there. Let's see. Do you then, happen to know, I, I want to interrupt real quick. I apologize. Do you happen to know how big those ceremony rooms are? Just they're different guesstimate. sizes. The 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 big ceremony room, the amphitheater size would have been like the size of um oh my gosh. Um not quite as big as as a high school auditorium, it's gonna be probably a third of that size. And it, the the one room that I'm thinking of or that this is all about is the, it's it's made, it had cement steps. It was poured with cement steps and the steps were more like benches and they were in a circular form and they were about two and a half feet deep. And then they went down and down and down. And then at the bottom is where they had this stage. So the amphitheater, like the seating went up and it was used as a purpose for um, you needed, they needed to have um, these, these platforms or these, you know, um, kind of cement steps 
so that they could be used for multi-purposes. So you can sit on them, you could stand on them and chant. You know, I remember there's a lot of standing and, and sitting. And then also you could, they could take their victims. And, you know, so they, I would be laid down or the other, you know, victims that were there. They could lay us down and rape us. Um, and that was always part of a ceremony or something like that. So there was a, it was needed to be so that flat, so that it could be used in a number of different ways. So this was a really large room. And then the stage down at the bottom was always used for, um, demonstrations, the thing, the reason, the thing I remember the most in there was, um, ritual killings and, um, it was so more people could be in the ceremony and witness always. They were in ceremonial robes. Usually there was a lot of chanting, always, you know, I was drugged, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I, I, it's important that 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 room like that the accessing of these different things is more than just that tunnel that you uh pointed out but basically here is the map that i drew let's see i want to see if that's what is that does that work really well or is yeah i see the temple in the upper corner and then there's a records area and then down here i see the amphitheater yep and then this this is going to be the tunnel that leads to the church office building area. Mm -hmm. Right there. Yeah. Okay. I see. Where's this? What's this pentagram here? That pentagram that room, that's going to be, that's a smaller room. Um, let me look at that really quick. Evil serpent head. <laughs> that's so funny. Cloaks and robes. Okay. This is a secret room behind a mechanical room. So this is going to be, um, from the from the old church office buildings, okay, so like the original church office building, that's the one that I would be taken to and delivered to, and um, then I'd go up the elevator, and then I would be with the offices and Tom Monson and, and um, other people like that. Anyway, at some point, um, this room was where I was taken downstairs, and this, at the bottom of the steps, the, the, the landing, you could go left or right left or right anyway um and we went left um down into and this is going to be that's this longer tunnel over um towards the uh joseph smith memorial building no that was the other way over towards temple square and just off to the right there was this uh room it just looked like a like a utility closet it was just a big metal door and there was no doorknob it was just a key and um this is the room where Monson pulled out a, a key and he unlocked this and it looked like a broom closet and then he moved there was like a false back so then he moved that aside and then this room opened up into this larger room and I would say well maybe the size of a, a small kitchen like it's it wasn't, it wasn't very big. It would be more of a single ceremony room. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a big pentagram painted on the floor. There was a serpent head, like a big snake with this, this serpent head sticking out um, on the wall adjacent. There were hooks and robes and then other things that um, could be accessed like I don't know. I want to say things like torture tools or or whatever, but it was also um, soundproof. So then he could close that door. The lighting was really dim. Um, there were candles if, if uh, they weren't needed or wanted to be lit, depending on what the ceremony was going to be about, who was being honored, um, what was being called up, that kind of thing. But anyway, that one, I remember that was just almost like, I mean, I don't mean to be trite, but it was almost like a lunch break. I'm going to go down and rape this child. Yeah. on my lunch break kind of thing and so you know taking 30 minutes or whatever like it certainly did not last longer than in you know 40 45 minutes it was a very relatively short ceremony for him to take me down there go through the motions of what he was going through lay me on this pentagram um go through his ceremonial things that he did and then rape me and then um close it out and you know then I had to accompany him back up to his office so that 
there was purpose in that. And the purpose wasn't necessarily for me to know what was going on. And it could have been, honestly, it could have been a lunch break. It could have been like, I want to rape a child, but I'm going to do it in this room kind of thing. So it, it's, it's possible that it was that I tend to think there was always meaning behind stuff, but that's what that room is. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I ask is one of the pictures that this ex employee sent me is an aerial view of construction that is going on right now on Temple Square. And it's, uh, it looks to be about maybe three layers down into the ground. And there are these rooms. And there are many of them side by side. They look to be about 15 by 15, mm -hmm. um, somewhere in that neighborhood. But next to each one, it looks like a broom closet. Mm -hmm. And he, this person doesn't know what these rooms are for. He just thought it was very interesting that the construction was happening in that way. But each, each room that is squared has a rectangular room mm -hmm. that looks like um, just like some sort of broom closet with each 15 by 15 and there are many we're talking like 10 15 at least that i saw in this picture right so the the rooms themselves or those those smaller rooms off to the side could could be a storage for robes um and for supplies depending on the way the hallway like how these rooms are connected to each other if there is access to these smaller rooms from that from that walkway or that hallway it could be something like this um mm -hmm. as well so it i guess it depends on on what the placement is and what the value of having um the larger rooms and the smaller rooms there's always value like to it just depends there's there's value in having the smaller rooms just because uh soundproofing is easier privacy you know that kind of thing it's it's not like a victim is going to not you know like i i would have made noise i would have you know said something done something screamed or whatever but then again you do need to remember that they take precautions against that as well so i was also drugged i would have been walking i would have been present in at least in the i'm putting one foot in front of the other and i'll look at this and in the meantime, like I was reading before, I would have been would have been being told certain things to remember because my the brain function they're also aware of is like the the part of my brain that is taking in information is also very compartmentalized. And so I needed to remember certain things about the tunnel systems and they wanted me to remember this. It's ironic to me though, this construction that they're doing specifically on the Salt Lake Temple, I mean. Basically, what they're doing is tampering with a crime scene. They're destroying a crime scene oh. and they're rebuilding. And from, uh, I guess, because of who I am and some of the um, information that does come to me, they're, it's sometimes nonchalant and sometimes not. But it was told to me that um, one of the one of the supers or one of the supers in, on the on the job site project or I don't know I'm I'm I might I'm probably misspeaking so don't quote me on that but somebody that was and is you hear that internet don't quote don't quote her <laughs> well, yeah don't quote me on this um is that it was there has been and was a directive by President Nelson and as far as the rooms go he was telling the um the blueprint or the construction people or whatever it's like we need more ceremony rooms i want to build more ceremony rooms and the assumption would have been like you know marriage ceremony rooms or whatever the heck that you know you might want to label it as but when it's underground like that and it's being designed the way it is these ceremony rooms always have well always is pretty abrupt would likely have dual purposes okay so whatever it is that they are um, being utilized he was nelson has directly said i want i want more ceremony rooms we need more ceremony rooms wow. the other thing about this too that they're doing my map my memory my ability to know my direction my way around um the tunnels that i would frequent is has probably been rerouted and is probably no longer accurate because of this construction. Mm. And I believe that this is happening 
mainly because there are people that are just remembering. The programming is set in place, but it's typical for people to age, and I'm not saying age out, but to age and start remembering, whether it is different hormonal, um, it, you know, different hormones that are naturally introduced into your body, or you get old enough that your perpetrators are just dying. And if that happens, a lot of times people will start remembering their traumas because their perpetrator and their abuser is no longer around to threaten that. And so they feel safe. And so these memories are going to start coming forward. And there's been a lot of people remembering the Logan Temple, the Salt Lake Temple, the St. George Temple, like the, you know, uh, the Manti Temple, like these original ones, the Washington DC Temple. And the information and the things they're remembering is really incriminating. And so Nelson is definitely going to, the group up there is going to get rid of this. this there's been a big debate and, and kind of an outcry that um, as in this uh, remodeling of the Salt Lake Temple, they're taking down or they're getting rid of or painting over the murals. So it used to be they had all the murals of the garden, you know, so Garden of Eden and, you know, all of these different things. And there are people that have been um, abused you know, in these rooms during these, you know, in these endowment places, in these endowment rooms um, that will remember this and say, and identify certain things because they're, they're like connecting the, the image that they're seeing in front of them while the trauma is going on. And there is enough evidence to say, no, that was in the Salt Lake temple and it was in this room or it was by that door or whatever. So they're, they're moving a lot of things around under under pretense of retrofitting or whatever the heck they're doing. They're really just trying to readjust a crime scene and upgrade their um, their facilities to accommodate other things that I think are terrifying, like AI. Like, could you imagine the programming that I had to go through? Now all you have to do is put, I mean, you know, in our archaic way, you know, like a artificial, not artificial intelligence, like a virtual reality helmet on somebody. And if you are in an altered state and you have this thing on, you're not going to know, but they could put, you, you could be anywhere. They could have flashing in front of your eyes, anything, and have you completely disoriented while you're being used and tested and, you know, uh, tortured and raped and that kind of thing. So just even being able to upgrade um, the facilities to accommodate things like that, I could see them doing that as well, which is horribly sinister. Well, we'll have to talk about both uh, voice to skull technology yes. and AI another time. If you're okay with this, I would like to shift gears and discuss Angela's comments. Well, let's, do that. let's do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Angela, she had some questions here for you. She said a question, but really it's like five. So are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, she says, I have a question for Asia. How do the adults stay in the cult? Oh, you are, okay. <laughs> How do the adults stay in the cult? The adults were children who were highly programmed to not be able to escape the cult. So that would be one way. So that's really like drawing a parallel to why adults grow up and continue to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They grew up in it and that's how they're programmed. This is just one step further or this would be, 10 yeah. steps further. Yeah, and you're not going to want to leave this cult, um, especially if you're involved in this level of it, because the programming is you don't leave or you die or you don't leave or something you care about or someone you care about will die. Like you... You will see enough murders that's just part of this to know that you don't leave. You just don't. And you don't talk about it. And I'm also talking from a, a conscious place. If, if you have been involved in this cult long enough, you will have different altars and they and you will have a forward altar, like one that presents all the time. Plus, you're going to have all the fractures in the back that can you can have different altars that are called up depending on who your handler is so the adults are going to stay in the cult and they may be in the cult they may be part of this blood cult um like unconsciously like like i was like they may not have full-on memories um of full-on experiences with it because the the part of them or the altar that is like your everyday altar has no experience with it right so 
it depends on if you are a slave to it and you're being used by it and your handler calls you in with it or if you actually choose in and this would be like an example would be my dad my dad at some point in this whole scenario decided or chose into being an active member in full consciousness you know like receiving instructions taking orders delivering me to places having you know like having us trauma bond after rituals and you know he's the one that rescues me he at some point would have said yes i'm in and and i i don't know when that point was i i'm certain it was before i was ever born i think this was part of his training because his parents my grandparents were part of this too and so he actually went through similar things that i did um as a victim and wherever whatever his process was at some point he uh he chose to align with it and he chose to align consciously with it and so um working up through the ranks um and being um part of that that system is still something that he is currently doing that's part of who he is uh, my mom is a slave to it. You know, he controls her and um, the parts and the altars that, you know, that that make her up. Uh, my sister has no memory recollection of it. My brothers have no me memory re recollection of it. So my dad would serve as the handler and just making sure that it stayed status quo. And then in at the same time, you're going to have to answer this question everybody has a reporter part. And I talked about that in one of our other, um, in, you know, like one of our other conversations. So you have the reporter, reporter part. If you start remembering the person you trust most is usually your handler and you're going to start talking about it. I'm having these nightmares. I wonder if this, oh my gosh, what about the, I'm not really sure about the leaders of this church, you know, whatever it is, if you're going to be like really spewing to your handler, to somebody's, you know, in this case would be like my dad. Oh my gosh, I'm worried. Um, depending on how severe what you're reporting is, would give them um, information on, you know, if if you just need to have some trigger words said, if you just need to have your, have a, you know, uh, your personality soothed, it's okay. And then brought back into ceremony and um, reminded that you don't want to remember this because you're going to be watching a murder or something like that, you know, that kind of thing. So it just depends on what happens. So they stay in depending on, who they are and what their what their value is to the group. Um, you don't age out of this. You you most people if you don't remember or if you're not access you know like really accessing most people will will die without having full knowledge that this was in part of their life. But uh, individuals that go through programming oftentimes have a particular suicide programming. Oh so yeah. So then leave. Mm -hmm. they are programmed to kill themselves 100 percent. yes yes that's going to be part the programming the suicide program is um embedded in uh, everybody all the victims have this suicide programming and they also have the reporting and recording programming those are just standard and the reason is is like that kind of it's like it's like your self-sabotaging mechanism that you're always present with yourself. And so that thought, the one that worked for me, I, I was I was highly aware of this when I was 10 years old. Um, the it's it's so tragic. The words that would come forward for me were, everyone would be better off without me. And the hard thing about that, the thing that's so devastating about that is that as a, as a compassionate child that loves people, right? Just, I just, you know, you're young, you love, right? As a compassionate human, the idea that everyone would be better off without me almost sounded reasonable. Like, oh, if this is going to help everyone else for me to not be here, that makes total sense. I should kill myself, right? And I remember having those, um, that particular phrasing, the most intense time I've ever, like I considered suicide a number of times um, because this program would kick on. But the, the most acute one that I personally remember viscerally, I remember being about 10 years old. I remember sitting on my back porch. I think this was probably a day, you know, like the day after a ceremony when I was 
you know, like still running trauma through my body. And I was just, I had, I didn't understand and I hated myself and I was so sad and all of this stuff. And I remember sitting on the back porch, just knowing, knowing that the world would be better off without me. And I could feel the dissociation and the hormones and the re remembering of the, of the drugs running through my body. And in, I guess in my mind, I was thinking, yeah, this is what the spirit's telling me and that kind of thing. Right. And the only thing in that moment that really shifted that energy was the dog. Like my dog saved my life. He oh. came up to me, he sat down, started licking my hand and I just started crying. Like at least the dog loves me. And, and that's in that moment as a 10 year old, that was a game changer. Like he saved my life because oh. in that moment, Oh, you know what? This was like, I bet you anything it was October, um, which would have been after conference, which would have been, yeah, there would have been a lot of like sacrifice season, October through Before December. the high holiday, the um, yeah. Halloween high holiday. Right. I just remember um, hunting season was on and there was, get this, my dad had gone hunting and, and there was a deer hanging in the garage that he had, that he had shot. And I was trying to figure out how to hang. I think I was trying to figure out how to hang myself by this deer. Like really as a 10 year old, this contemplation was really moving. There was a real process moving through, moving through me in that. And, and the thing that, that really brought me out of it was my dog. So this program is present and it's present. And I'm not saying anyone that considers suicide has this program. I am just saying, anyone that has this program will it can it can kick on and it can be very active and it can make sense in a really bizarre yeah. way right yeah. okay um i think we may have answered her next question which was how does she understand that her father could be part of such an evil i think that's part of the first question don't you think yeah, you remember yeah. that okay let's move to the next one was it out of fear that he stayed? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I know underlying everything, fears at the root of all of this. Like this, this whole, this whole um organization, this whole root of everything is is based in fear, certainly not based in love. Right. And so if you're gonna, you know, like kind of umbrella the answer to that, yeah, it's based in fear. But power is based in fear, manipulation is based in yes. fear, all of that. So whatever sounded reasonable to him i'm not i don't know i it's always been a mystery to me it, i mean i don't i don't know that he'd even be able to answer it because he's so much in playing the role that even if i approached him and confronted him with like i know everything he'd be going i don't know what you're talking about you know so yeah we we'll probably never know the answer to that her next question is do they become addicted to the power oh yes yes definitely the the it's more than just the adrenaline. Like, so you will have like physical um, reactions, like you'll have physical experiences, like with your hormones, with your adrenaline, with all of that, that um, you will find preferences for. There's, you know, adrenaline junkies that go out, you know, they just have to feel that rush. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be, you know, some, some of the, of the individuals um, may have the preference of the adrenaline rush. Others may even like the smell of blood, you know, some, like have this, you know, this uh, propensity towards um, screaming pain. They want to see, they want to see the pain in your eyes mm -hmm. and they want to push a person past that. They might be sexually motivated by it. This may fill a whole bunch of um, sexual uh, addictions. In essence, I mean, for all of them that are in this, I would say that there is a giant insatiable hole of that they're trying to consume and fill. And, and these, and these addictions somehow go there. And in addition to that, not only are they seeing and experiencing rapes, blood, carnage, you know, scientific, you know, uh, pressures, whatever, there's the presence of demonic forces. And that's also going to be given, um, at least your auric field, if nothing else, and a charge, because there's a power that comes in with that too. So yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. And, and also with the consumption of the blood, when the victim is being terrorized, they are releasing adrenaline into their bloodstream via the fear. And so when you're consuming that you're taking in the adrenaline. 
Absolutely. And so that can be very addictive. And it also has um, ageless properties, Why? Um, which is why we see a number of these celebrities that don't seem to age. I'm not talking about their plastic surgery and the latest mm -hmm. diet fads. I'm talking about them drinking the adrenal chrome, which right. has the adrenaline in the blood, which has the addictive qualities. Yeah, Correct. this is why these guys can get into their 90s plus and and you and they're and they they don't quite they don't quite look it. I mean they are they're looking older, but you're you know, they're getting very old, but they're also in this ageless um range of like what you're just talking about. And I think their skin gets a little glassy too. It's a little weird. She says, Do they really believe it to be true? What oh, yeah. the heck? I know this may seem naive. No, 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 no. That's not a naive question because again, you, you understanding that your moral code and your sense of what's human, what's right, what what is joy, what is God, what is spirit, what is you know um, progression. This idea that you have, you are projecting onto them. So it's kind of like, how could somebody possibly do that? The truth is they don't think at all like you, like they don't think at all, at all. They, they exploit the fact that we're good people all the it's time. It's parasitic thinking. It's yeah, absolutely. So how can I know? I know that, you know, they know that we as good people are going to want to give somebody the benefit of the doubt. They know we're going to project. I'm going to project who I am onto you just because that's how we know each other. And then it's like, oh, you're not like that because, you know, like we have ourselves as the source of reference. So like, I'm going to assume you're, you're a good person. And then you get the propaganda, you know, especially in the church. These guys are talking to God. Jesus is walking with them in the halls of the temple, all of this stuff. So suddenly you're putting that hierarchy in a way that you would relate to. Then none of that's happening. These guys are not talking to God. They're talking to their God. I mean, you know, he's showing up and he's like, you know, demanding consumption of people and kid children and blood. But no, they're not talking to to the God you think that you would love to sit and and commiserate with. That's not we give them this different idea and they just completely run. They let us they just let us do it. They don't think like we do at all. Well, let's talk about discernment. Because we talk in the church, and I, I don't want to lump myself in with that anymore. The church mm -hmm. talks about the importance of developing discernment, and yet there is no development of it. Because the freedom of choice that they talk about, uh, our greatest gift, free agency, is really presented in a way that you need to believe what we tell you to believe, have the testimony of the things that we tell you to have a testimony of. And if you don't believe that, you need to continue to fast and pray until you get the answers, mm -hmm. the approved answers. The approved and, answers yeah. Yes. And so because of that, you think that you have developed discernment, but really what you've done is you fall in line with the social programming and you have had no development of discernment. And wow. so when we get to this point where we, we allow ourselves to question, we don't know how to gauge that barometer. And so it's very easy to fall into this religion or the new age world or to be susceptible over here. We have so many questions and this process can take years to get through detaching from the church because we don't trust ourselves. We right. haven't developed that discernment. Right. right. And the other thing, that. In, in addition to that, there is this looming fear that you want to discern so you don't either get it wrong or you don't walk yourself into trouble or you don't have to experience something painful. And, and the irony behind all of that is that's, that's not true. The way that we are on this planet with the planet being what it is, the way that we actually grow and understand is from feedback. So if our discernment, if you're asking for more discernment, you can count on walking yourself right into a situation that you're going to have to discern, discern. And it's not a punishment. If you're wanting really, you've got to know the difference between something. You can't just 
want to have discernment and somehow, you know, angelic voices are going to be coming through your head saying, that's wrong and that's right. That's still not you and that's not choice. That's something else playing upon you. As humans, as as spiritual beings that really want to have their own like discernment, their own progression, like we do want to be more than who we are. These are our lessons. These are things that we want to actually experiment with. We want to know, we want to know how to do it. Like if you were always tying your your child's shoes and they never learned, like what happens? Do they hire somebody to continue tying their shoes? Do they live up? Like that makes, it sounds silly, but that's exactly what it is. That we don't want that. The child pretty soon is like, no, I want to do it myself. I want to do it myself. You know, like I want to do this. And that's the same kind of spirit, that same kind of like human desire that we have is like, I want to understand. I want to know. I want to know this. I want to get this. So there's nothing wrong with you asking for discernment, really wanting to understand and discern. And you're going to like run into the face of your enemy. That's, that's not a bad thing that, but you're not, (laughs) you're not going to necessarily know that until you interface and interact and then trust yourself and, and then realize it's like, Oh, I see this now. Wow. That was a hard lesson. You know? I mean, I just got done with one of those myself in February. It blew my mind. See, and you you tied it back to what we were talking about earlier, which is learning to trust yourself. And most people don't know how to do that. Yeah, they they scary. question themselves. It they, it is scary. You know, I, um, I first went to a seminar uh, with this particular lady in my late. 20s and she took us back to the very basics of learning how to discern within yourself Mm -hmm. using yes and no so for example we had to close our eyes and we had to feel what no felt like or we had to do basic questions like my name is joe well, I know my name isn't Joe and that's an obvious thing that I can discern, but I had to feel what that felt like inside. And I could feel like my chest um, contracting and I knew it wasn't true. So then I would sit there and do the opposite. My name is Madeline. I would go with something that was true. I know for a fact that that is true. And then I would feel what the truth felt like. And I could physiologically start to discern the difference between lies and truth. And then as you take something so simple like that and you start using other things to gauge, um, once that you have established that barometer inside, your discernment can start to grow from there. So when you start, but you have to also remember that we have intuition, we have instincts, that sometimes we just, something smells shady. We just know right from the start, our intuition says, that's BS. Mm-hmm. And so we have to learn to trust that. Yes. How did Absolutely. you learn to trust yourself? Boy, that's been a long process. Um, and it took me a long time uh, to actually be able to feel like I was really trusting myself because the program um, is to default to allowing somebody else to be the authority yes. or the, the one that has, you know, knows because I don't know if I don't know something, then whoever does is going to immediately be the authority. But that phrasing right there can get switched. And I can say, okay, I don't know this, but if I was going to feel into this, what would this look like for me? Kind of like, you know, that's, that's light. What would this look like for me? Does this feel true? Does this feel false? Does this feel like interesting? Like making it really light Mm -hmm. at first is just like what you were saying, like, learn what no feels like, learn what yes feels like, you know, you're going to, your body isn't going to lie. And this is one of those things that I, uh, my therapist would tell me a lot too, when I was in the, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I, that's just crazy. You know, the brain is going through the, I don't have anywhere to put this. And, and he was just like, what did your body do? Well, my body was twitching and shaking. And what were your emotions? Well, I was screaming. He's like, your body isn't going to lie. Like there's no, your body has none of this motive to go. I think I'm going to really mess with you here and, and start twitching and and flailing, you know? And, and that, so anyway, there's, there's that also, but I, I remember um, a couple years ago, I wanted to understand discernment even more. And 
Um, understanding this is only two years ago, right? So I'm pretty far along in understanding and my experience with um, dark forces, like uh, feeling, feeling spirits, feeling, you know, entities, demons come in the room or, you know, whatever. Um, and yet I knew that I didn't know everything. I knew that I didn't know. And so I was asking for more. Um, and the way I was asking is I was just saying, I, I want to know, I, I want more discernment. I need to understand the nuances. And so I would have experiences where um, something dark would come in the room and I would notice me and how there was like no fear. Like I, that was kind of astounding to me. It's like, wow, I'm really not afraid of this thing. And um, a lot of times I would end up kind of inwardly rolling my eyes like now I'm tired I don't want to deal with this you know it was it was more like this is annoying versus oh my gosh the things in my room you know and um there was one experience where oh my gosh the discernment was um really a, a test between I I guess I'll just tell you what it was like in this experience and it's kind of in that in-between zone where you're not awake but you're awake you know you're not sleeping you're in that zone and in this experience i was um i remember i was holding i have a i have a, a cat and i was holding my cat here's my cat and here is my cat i was holding my cat in my hands identical identical and the cat well both cats were like crying and writhing in pain and it made my heart really like sad, like, oh my gosh, how do I have, you know, like what's going on? And I remember kind of feeling into that and recognizing something's off about this. And so I felt into like, it's almost like immediately my heart felt, felt into both. And the one in my left hand felt hollow. It just felt like empty counterfeit. It just felt like not real. And this one felt like, okay, this would be real. This is like, there's a heart here. There's like, a, there's, there's something very real here. Right. And, um, and then, and then that just kind of went away and disappeared. And I went, I went back to sleep. And when I woke up that morning, um, I was in prayer and I was like, what, what the hell, what was that about? Right. And the conversation with God was basically, um, what did you learn about the cats? Cause I had had that, that was kind of the culmination. I had had three, three separate experiences and that was the last one. And the question was like, what did you learn about the cats? And I said, well, I learned, I learned to use my heart. I learned that my heart would tell me what was, what was counterfeit and what was true. And when I had that answer, like when I actually said that to myself, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, wow, we really do know. We really do know the difference between the counterfeit and the real. There is substance and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm not saying asking you're going to have that kind of experience. That's just what I, I was personally ready for. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I was ready for another experience with another human being who was actually being run by a very large entity who was actually so fractured and, um, in agreement with with something else that she thought was God, which is not God, and um, I didn't see it until I saw it, and it was very similar to this cat experience where I'm like, whoa, I see the counterfeit, I see the emptiness, and um, that that whole that whole experience, gosh, took almost it took almost two years for me to actually go through it get introduced get in relationship you know and then finally get into a close enough relationship that when the breakdown happened it was really clear so you know you it, it can happen like the discernment and the learning process is something you've got to in my opinion you've got to ask for yeah. and be willing to walk that path I mean, I've even had people ask me, it's like, do I really need to know all this stuff? Do I really need to see how, like, really see how deep this goes? Do I really have to know the truth about all of this? And I just have always found that to be such an interesting and kind of naive question because it's like, well, how well do you want to know? In this case, I mean, use the word enemy. How well do you want to know your enemy? Like, 
if you don't, you're going to be sabotaged on all levels. Like yep. it's, it's so fascinating to me. It Government, mean- religion, all medical, uh, education, all of it. We talk about Satanism in terms of Mormonism, but really that's just one arm. It's pervasive everywhere. And so yeah. to develop discernment here is to develop discernment across the board. It is. That's what's so valuable. You don't have to have, you might be listening to this and go, I'm not, I was never Mormon. I'm not interested, but you might have um, experience in other areas and same thing can happen, you know, like as you discern, it's, it's basically discerning truth and faults. It's discerning the, well, the matrix, the, the, the maze, the thing that is in front of us that we have just been so asleep in Mm-hmm. And really seeing your place in that. So as you're walking forward and walking through and actually seeing, you get what in Mormonism you to- you're you told that you already had, which is free will or choice, you actually end up getting that. You actually do recognize that you have um, awareness, which gives you more choice, that kind of thing. Like when you're in a situation with the Mormon church and they and they say like what you were saying, Pray till you get the right answer. I mean, when you're in a situation where it's like choice is basically within this container, that's not choice. That's not choice. There's, it's kind of like, here's the dinner plate. You can choose what you want to eat first. And there's the buffets going on behind you and you don't even know. Right, right. And you know, I, I hope people will understand that this takes time to develop. I've mm-hmm. mentioned in previous videos before, I don't repeat myself. I don't like to do that. However, it's been a long time since we talked about some of these subjects. And yeah. your spiritual awareness, your spiritual eye is a muscle and it takes time to develop. Just like going to the gym, you don't decide one day you're going to go work out and go pick up 50 pound dumbbells. You have to work into that. The same thing is true with your spiritual eye or your spiritual awareness. You have to spend time being disciplined and cultivating your spiritual body. And discernment is the same thing. You don't just wake up one morning going, it's there, I trust myself. You Mm -hmm. trust yourself through practice and through experience and through development. Absolutely. And development is a great word because... If you want to think about like the fear we have is making the mistake, especially in the church, the mistake equals sin equals God is now like, you know, going to punish you equals you need to repent, all of that stuff. If you can actually give yourself a different word and say the mistake is feedback, if if you can move yourself forward and you're just getting more feedback, oh, well, there was a brick wall. can't go that way. I'll go this way. That's a whole different thing. Like, gosh, I made a mistake. I just may as well beat myself with the iron rod and, you know, just kind of like, just stay with that. You're slipping down in your um, levels of glory with each mistake that you make. <laughs> this, and that keeps you in the spin. That will actually keep you in there, in, in this yeah. whole power. Now I don't feel like worthy to pray and God's not going to give me discernment. And I've got to do, you know, and you, you end up giving yourself this like laundry list of why you can't discern. And they're like, go ahead. You just go ahead and stay there versus, all right, that I'm just going to wad up, throw out the window. And I'm just going to keep trying and trusting. Like yeah. that's a pretty good strategy. And you need to start there, you know? And it is part of discerning because now if you are doing that with awareness, you can equate that. Well, what did I experience? What did I learn? And now I know that that was not the correct path. And so as you learn from that and you move into another direction, which happens to be where you need to be Mm -hmm. uh, with reflection, you can look back and discern part of our discernment. Okay. Why did I make this choice versus why did I make that choice? And so as you start to become aware of the difference, that discernment is part of the process. Absolutely. You're going to make mistakes and that's how you're supposed to learn. That's how you're supposed to learn. The mistakes are not to be demonized, although they have been. So, you know, that whole inversion of what we're living in is, is actually our learning process has been demonized. Our learning process has been put in front of us as shameful and sinful. And that's that's tragic because you get caught in that and, and you you feel that you should be in this perfected state or moving towards perfection. 
which means, you know, you need to shun the appearance of evil, you know, all of the things. And so then you end up condemning others, which is so funny to me. But you get you get into a place where that condemnation turns in on you and you become um, your own worst enemy. In addition to having the entities and all of the languaging and all of the programming from the church running their programs through you. So it's not an easy thing. Like, like you said, you don't just wake up one morning and just say, I'm, you know, I'm better now. It's not going to happen. It, you have to practice. I, I loved your analogy of the, of the gym. Like you're not going to go, you're not going to go lift weights and suddenly be toned. You need, and you, you also need to be eating well, and you also need to be aware of your body and, you know, hydrating and, you know, all of that. It's a multifaceted thing. So discernment, discernment is also multifaceted and and it's worth that, again, it's worth that journey for sure. I, I feel like we could talk about this for another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could. Which means we'll be talking on the phone tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we sure will. All right. So let's wrap it up there. Any parting words for the audience? Oh, I just love where we've been with the trusting yourself and discerning. Um, I would, honestly... If you feel that this is where you are and you want to step into really honoring uh, this new process or um, refining your process of trusting yourself, um, this is something that self-evaluation is really going to be helpful in. Get a personal journal or a notebook or whatever you want to call it, tracking mechanism, you know, your phone, whatever. And... Um, as you're making your choices, as you're looking at things that stress you out and you make and you make these bold moves to trust yourself, make note of that. I chose to do this and I felt an incredible amount of peace or super huge anxiety or like you can start looking and piecing together things where you actually will show yourself, wow, I'm really strong when it comes to saying, you know, yes to this or no to that or whatever. And I can see that anytime I have to, you know, like say no to, um, I don't know, like a family member, I cave. Okay. You know, like I can, I'm going to trust myself and I'm actually going to learn some languaging around that. And I'm going to find ways that I can support myself and say, yeah, I did. Okay. I did. This is okay. And take that feedback and you know, whatever the feedback is, write that down. Wow. I didn't expect that. Or wow. I didn't expect that, you know? And I feel like that is so valuable because the more and more and more, as you said earlier, it's not just the church. It is across the board. Discernment is, is the thing that is going to be needed in, in this journey that each of us is on, because at the end of the day, it's, it really is you and God. And if you've got all of the wires crossed in here, because you're not trusting yourself, you're going to be on some kind of a weird cycle journey that, you know, God will be there, but you're still not going to get the messages. You need to really kind of start cleaning that up. And, um, and you can do that, like just gently, you know, and trusting and enjoying and learning from that. I love that. You and God. You and God. Don't need a middleman. I've been saying that for a long time, whether it's the Pope, the priest or the prophet. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. You don't need that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It is such a treat for me to be able to talk with you and other survivors because I find you guys so incredibly strong. The journey that you guys have been on, you are a fantastic example of being at the lowest lows and coming out on top and the healing path that you guys take is just inspirational. And I hope individuals will focus on that because yes, we talk about the tough stuff, but I hope that above all else that the audience is taking away the fact that you can heal mm -hmm. and nothing is insurmountable. So Absolutely. having said that, I am going to put your contact information into the description box. Tell people where they can reach you. So they can send emails to info dot letters to the people at protonmail.com. And you can also listen to my podcast, um, letters to the people.com as well. Those are two really good ways to find me. I'm still working on my other website. Eventually you'll be able to find me on asiarain.com. 
and see more of what it is that I'm doing there, um, that's still on pause. Uh, but for right now, that would be the best way to, to reach out, get a hold of me and um, just share. This has been so valuable to talk to you. I love our interaction and I feel like it's very um, educational and, and validating in a lot of ways. And I appreciate the questions too. You know, like I'm really glad people drop questions in there that that we can respond to um, because they're very important, you know, and, and valuable. They're not, you know, if you're asking the question, there's a number of other people that probably have the same one. So yeah, drop it in. Great. I have a fantastic audience. We're small. So spread the word, like, and subscribe, spread the word because a lot of people can um, grow from this material and it can help them along their journey. And you never know who's ready for what kind of information. So you can reach me at galactic storyteller at gmail.com. And we will, oh, before I say, we'll see you in the next video. If you leave a comment, the two things that I always ask is one, be kind and two, provide resources. If you have an alternate view, great. But please provide resources. That way it opens up a dialogue and we love that. So uh, thank you for joining us here today and we will see you in the next video.